So welcome to the ECMI webinar, uh, Mathematics of the COVID-19 Crisis in the Eye of the Storm. Uh, it is organized by the European Consortium of Mathematics in Industry, ECMI. Um, uh, ECMI is a large association of more than 100 universities across uh, Europe. And when the crisis uh, started to evolve, um, we thought uh, to bring uh, uh, together some experts that have been working on the modeling of COVID uh, and who are with us today. So we have with us five experts that will relay their modeling efforts on COVID-19. Uh, also with us is uh, Professor Schorf from the Technical University of Denmark, who is also the ECMIN director. And Paul, uh, hi Paul, uh, will um, be one of the moderators uh, for today. Um, also, uh, uh, Professor Miguel Bustamante from the uh, University College Dublin will be other moderator. Um, I am Katerina Kauri, as you, you can see, and uh, you will be posting uh, questions on the live chat where you are in the YouTube channel. Our two moderators will be reading these questions in real time. Each speaker has 20 minutes to speak. Uh, maximum, and then we'll have 10 minutes for a question and answer a session. In those 10 minutes, uh, the moderators will be asking your questions to the speaker. Um, and also, um, uh, here we also have Professor Dietmar Homper, who is kindly providing all the technical assistance and the connection from, from Zoom to YouTube. So with this, I would like to welcome our first uh, a speaker. This is Professor Rosa Crujeras. Uh, hi, Rosa. Um, and uh, Rosa uh, is at the University of Santiago de Compostela. She's also at the Technological Institute for Industrial Mathematics, ITMADI, um, um, Spain uh, Spanish Network for Industrial Mathematics. And she will talk to us uh, for her work that she has been doing with the COVID modeling. So, uh, Rosa, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And thanks also to all the audience who are following us in YouTube. So my talk of today uh, won't be too technical, so sorry if you're expecting many formulae, but uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you about a cooperative experience in Spain that has allowed us to share knowledge and skills for understanding better the COVID-19. If we recall how, um, how all this began, it seems long ago, but it's uh, about five months, we have in December 19 this health crisis in China, in Wuhan, but it soon hit at Europe, starting in Italy with the first case confirmed at the end of January. And then uh, the number of confirmed cases ran uh, really, really fast, which grown really, really fast, with 2,000 cases at the beginning of March, which led to a global lockdown of the country on the 9th of, of March. In Spain, the first case was also confirmed on the 31st of January. It was confirmed in one of the Canary Islands. Uh, and in the 26th of February, we already have indicators of local contagious, 50 cases at that time, 83 cases on the 1st of March. And we have been on a lockdown since the 14th of March. Yesterday evening, the government has announced a, a plan for trying to go back to normal life, whatever normal life means after this. Um, this soon became a global problem for all of us. Uh, data from today in Spain, more than uh, 24,000 deaths, 24, deaths, and more than uh, 200,000 confirmed cases. Okay, I think that with this situation, we, this is a problem for all of us, but it's also a problem for other countries that do not have the same facilities, the same healthcare systems as, as, as we are. So, I think that we, we, we need to share uh, our knowledge with also with them. Of course, from this very beginning, there were uh, groups of experts from different fields in mathematics that were trying to model how this uh, COVID-19 were spreading. But uh, this all sent us home, right? And I think that this, uh, 
uh, this uh, raises the curiosity in all of the people working with models, with data modeling, just to try to do something. How could we help? And uh, uh, we could see that at least in Spain, since uh, all this has started, there was many people just arranging data just to uh, make them accessible and treatable for like, other colleagues, visualizing data, fitting models, explaining methods that could do a good work on this, and also making predictions. It was clear that there was a will from the mathematical community in Spain to, to help, to help the authorities to take good decisions based on uh, good information. But there was a lack of organization. Okay, there was many people, but no structure. And it's in this time when the CIMAS, the Spanish Committee of Mathematics, takes the floor. The Spanish Committee of Mathematics uh, launched an open call to all the mathematical community asking for our contribution, saying, okay, what can you do? What are your skills and what are your capacities as a mathematician, as a statistician? Yes, she. Uh, do something together to understand what's really going on and how this will evolve. So they launched the Mathematical Action Against Coronavirus. Okay, this is a global initiative uh, in the framework of CIMAT, and they uh, said like, yeah, let's say like three main areas of work. First, the first task was to collect links and contributions from all the mathematical community and make them accessible on a uh, on a joint uh, place, which is the website of this uh, mathematical action against Corona. And uh, uh, the, all the mathematical community, we were asked, okay, what, what you can do? We send also our, our ideas or methods or findings. And they did a really good job in promoting discussion among us and in creating working groups and different areas. And this was done by the establishment of an a uh, committee of experts whose president is Ricardo Cao from the University of A Coruña and whose coordinator is uh, Alfonso Cordaliza from the University of Valladolid, who is also the president of, of CIMAT. This group of experts collect all of our collaborations and prepare a really good report collecting our, what could be our contributions, our capacities and suggestions to the, to the authorities. They did this report, they sent it to the authorities in Spain who are in charge of the uh, health system. And this, and now I have to explain that in Spain, uh, the health system uh, is governed by the regional governments, okay? So we have a central ministry of health, but the administration in each region depends on each, uh, on each region it, itself. So it's our, they are the regions who are reporting the data to the Ministry of, of, of Health. Well, this send this our suggestions, our capacities, our ideas to the authorities. And in principle, we get a really positive answer from the minister. And they also even uh, give us, okay, some priorities, what they do really need. And one of these priorities was short-term predictions. Okay, short-term predictions for a series of variables you have here, so uh, patients requiring intensive care, hospitalized cases, this is new cases or confirmed cases, which in principle, in spirit at least, are the same variables that other uh, countries are uh, managing, maybe not in definition. And uh, the variables should be, they, they, they were interested in having predictions in the short term, the one to seven days uh, forecast at national level, but also at regional, at regional level. Okay, so there had been a lot of people already doing predictions uh, with this data were public and some of us were already handling it. So how could we take advantage of our knowledge or all the work that has been done just to uh, satisfy this, this demand? Well, the idea was to create a cooperative predictor. This cooperative predictor, the, uh, the goal is to, okay, let's take all the contributions that we have from different areas, from different models, from different perspectives, and do something that gets the best of all of them, okay? Let's combine them. This uh, project was coordinated by Jose Antonio Vilar from the University of A Coruña, and I have to thank him for all the information he, he passed so, so I can uh, talk to, to you about this, this project to, today. There were, actually, there has been more than 40 groups that have contributed to this cooperative uh, predictor, at least for some of the variables, 
at national or at regional uh, levels. So the results of this cooperative prediction uh, predictor, you can uh, see it on this website. You have information about the results on the different series, different combinations for uh, the cooperative predictor. I will take about, uh, talk about this uh, later. And you also have some technical information on how these combinations are produced, about the groups who are collaborating and about their methodologies, the methods that they followed. So the methods, you can imagine that when you have more than 40 groups involved in, the, in, in this task, there are many, many options to, to, to proceed with short-term predictions. We have on the one hand, this classical compartmented models, the SIR and its variants, including exposed, asymptomatic cases and so on. But you have also some uh, purely, let's say, statistical techniques based on time series, based on simulation methods, like the simulation boosting or branching uh, processes. Some other approaches based on spatial temporal modelings or hidden Markov models, and another group, let's say, that are based on regression approaches. Okay, uh, the, in this setting, we consider nonlinear regression, regression with compositional data, functional and dynamical regression, and also generalized regression models. And I would like to say a, bit, a, a few words about this part and a specific choice of generalized regression model, which is the Richards model. This is the predictor the, that we have working on. It's, uh, it's, this is a joint collaboration with Jose Amejeras from KU Leuven and also from Sat Group 19, a group of statisticians from Italy who deserve the credit of uh, putting this uh, methodology, uh, of adapting this methodology to create the short-term predictions for, for this series. So what do we do? Well. Um, we uh, confront the problem of predicting okay, this series. Remember, hospitalized cases, uh, disease cases, patient recurring unit curves. We do it through a regression approach. So we have a cumulative accounting series, something that is counting, okay, how many cases are we accumulating each day, a long time, day one, day two. Okay, the Richards model is a flexible growth model, it's a general. Um, a kind of generalized logistic model that allows us to model this evolution of the counting series over time. And in the end, what we explain is the expected value of this counting series for next days. So why, why this model? Um, as I mentioned in my second slide, uh, Italy is a bit ahead of Spain in the evolution of COVID-19. From the very beginning, this group of statisticians, Stat Group 9 and 10, they had been working on different methodologies from a purely statistical perspective to uh, let's check what if we can do good predictions in, in our data. And uh, well, they came out with this, this model. They proved that it was it worked reasonably well for, for Italy. So somehow we had already a model that had been tested, let's say, on real data. And the other reason, which is quite important, is that the model, it's quite flexible, it's easy to fit, and it allows us to identify some elements in the model that may be of interest, that are really of interest uh, when someone has to take decisions about, about this. The elements of the model are, let's say, just a lower asymptote, an upper asymptote. So we have a cumulative curve, and this upper asymptote is in, important, for instance, in the modeling series, like the demands of intensive care or the hospitalized cases. Okay, that's important also to know if the resources that we have are enough or not. Then we have a slope, an increasing rate, and we have the peak. Okay, if instead of thinking about the cumulative curve, you think about the daily changes, then you have the, the peak, it's, yes, let's say, the point where the series starts decreasing or the inflection point in the cumulative series. And we also allow, this model also allows for an asymmetry parameter that controls that the rate, the speed rate in entering the peak is not the same speed rate as leaving the peak. So the model is as simple as this. You can see that you have all the elements uh, inside the model, and these parameters can be the mo this model can be fitted just by maximum likelihood methods. So we can get estimates of these parameters, and in this maximum likelihood framework, 
So it's easy also to get variabilities about this estimate. So we have also confidence intervals for the different parameters. For instance, it's relevant for the peak and also for the upper asymptote. Um, and this variability, uh, for those of you who, is, who are familiar with this maximum likelihood methods, it's just done by approximating the Fisher information information metrics. So that's nothing very, very sophisticated. And uh, yes, one mentioned also, the model can be also adapted to include the effect of a covariate just by a reparametrization of the difference between the uh, upper and lower asymptotes. So, uh, Stats Group 19 in, in, uh, in Italy, they, uh, they had produced also some code for fitting this model, assuming that's also important that the counting series follows the Poisson produce or a negative binomial distribution. And uh, what we did also jointly with uh, Jose Mejeras, I mentioned from K11, uh, we have this uh, shiny app that you can check on the website that allows, allows you to fit this model to different series of data, disease, cases, uh, intensive care demands for different countries. Uh, you have Spain, you have Italy, you have Portugal, but you have also, you have Belgium, but you have also data from the European uh, Center for Disease Control and also from the John Hoskin database. In some cases, for instance, for Italy, for Spain, uh, you can also have you, you can also check the series and the fit of the series for different regions. You can do comparisons. You can visualize comparisons. Okay, and you can also add the date of political measurements. Um, the uh, the spread of the disease did not start at the same time in all the countries, and you can also do an alignment. Of the, of the series just to make them coincide at the same point. You have information about the predictions and also about where do we get all the, the, the databases. Let me show you uh, one, of, one of the plots because uh, this, is, this is also important comparisons. Okay, let's, there's a, a, a lot of debate, at least in Spain about, and I guess also in your countries about, is, is the government taking the right decisions? Well, I, I think it's hard to do a comparison first, uh, and I will go at this point at the end. That's because uh, I, I'm not sure we have the same data. Uh, we don't have the uh, certain that all the countries are measuring exactly the, uh, the same. But at least to check the trend of what we are, uh, what we are uh, measuring, this is for these cases, uh, you may have an idea of what's what's happening. Um, the dotted uh, curve is Italy, the squares uh, is Spain, green France and yellow Germany. You can say yes, the behavior of Gen Germany, but flat. You can see in Sp Spain in principle at some point it was, it was going worse than Italy, but we reached the peak almost at the same time. And uh, you can, we don't know if that's causation, but at least we also have the, the, um, the measurements taken by the government a bit earlier than, than Italy, and we were directly on lockdown for the whole country. So this is nice in, in the sense of, okay, let's, we can, you can do also some visual comparisons, okay. This was a part of the different approaches that, the, that were sent to this cooperative predictor. Okay, so just recall that we have this series of variable patients requiring uh, intensive care, hospitalized case disease, new case and confirmed cases. We have a lot of methods for doing short-term predictions, and the approach was to do combination. The first ideas about forecast combinations were provided by Bates and Granger, and the, uh, the goal is to find an optimal combination which produces precise and stable series. Okay, there's not a, a single way of doing it, as you can imagine. And actually, we also confront uh, serious problems for doing this because of, uh, the series are not very long and not all the methods were providing uh, predictions for all the series. So in this sense, it was a bit heter uh, heterogeneous. And another issue is that there's not a very strong theoretical basis on what to do. 
and uh, the strategy mostly depends on how is your data. So the group coordinated by uh, Jose Antonio Villar, they uh, consider different uh, combinations. You can see that the first four are quite simple, just an average, a median, a trim min, and a winsorized min, just a, a sample average of all the predictions for a certain day for all the different methods. And uh, the other three, two, three, and four, just robust, more robust uh, um, approaches. The other uh, predictors, the other combined predictors, five, six, and seven, um, the idea behind them is okay. Uh, for doing this combination, we have to do more weight to those methods that behave better, whose performance is, is uh, whose performance is better in the near past. Okay, so methods that have been provided good predictions get a higher weight, and this is uh, this is uh, done by different by different um, approaches. So let's imagine that you have like two kinds of combination at this time. Just as I mentioned, it's the period is, is short to, to be able to do something more, uh, more um, complex. Just to show you how this, this, this works, and you can check also these results, not in this, in this form, but visually on a graph in the website that we, where we are making public all the, all the, the results from the uh, cooperative predictor. The best combination uh, it's uh, given in this table for all the serious intensive care hospitalizations, disease for the different horizons from one to seven days. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have sign, okay, which is the best combination that we get and uh, uh, mean absolute uh, percentage effort that we, that we get. And you can see that in most of the table you get CPO1, CPO2, which is average or median. And you can see that the um, mean absolute position error uh, between four or seven percent in these variables for the disease and confirmed cases, and it's a, it's a bit low, it's a bit lower, sorry. Um, but the most sophisticated predictors almost do not appear. Well, here it's maybe 07 or five. And uh, yeah, the the problem that uh, it's uh, it was found here um, is that okay this. Uh, more sophisticated predictor suffer more the variability and the heterogeneity in the data. You can see that the last column in this table is empty because the uh, error that we get is, is completely unacceptable. And why this is how, uh, why this happens? Well, the data. Okay, I don't know if. Uh, you who are also working with with data have encountered this problem, but for us it, it has been it has been really really disappointing. For instance, in intensive care and hospitalizations in this series, uh, I told you that in Spain uh, the the reports of the data uh, is done by the regions and they send their data to the central government. Depending on the region, this data may be accumulated or maybe a prevalence, and you may say, okay, this you can then you cannot do it for. Um, national level, but you can do it for regions. No, because some regions change the criteria at some point. And even in mortality data, some days we will find diseases in cumulated, uh, we, we, we found decreases in cumulated mortality. Uh, this is not only a problem of Spain, it also happens in, in, in other countries, and that makes, a, that makes it really difficult. So something to think about, or no matter if we have good models, we know that our models are wrong because they, they are not reality, but they, some of our models are useful to model reality. But at least in the models that we have from the statistics that we purely rely on the data, if our data are not good, that may compromise our, our findings and our conclusions. And just to finish, the take home message. I think that many this questions is a actually great opportunity YouTube. to share knowledge across countries. This is a global problem that has hit at first us, but now is hitting Latin America and it will get to Africa. And I think that with a global view, we will be able to get a better insight on what's happening uh, with the COVID-19. And we will also able to do fair comparisons, also to evaluate how the measurements taken, uh, if the measurements taken are effective or not. So thank you very much for attending this conference.
So thank you very much, uh, Rosa, for a fascinating talk. It's great to have uh, Spain here with us. Uh, we have many, many questions I hear from our moderators. Um, so uh, I will um, let them um, ask them to you. And we'll have 10 minutes for the question and answer session before we move on to the next uh, speaker. Hi. Uh, so first question is, um, you mentioned the predicted variables have different potential definitions. Uh, do you think that the use of alternative definitions could lead to potentially different conclusions? Well, in, uh, in, in some cases, I think, um, we, for instance, in Spain, we, we got some changes in the criteria of uh, collecting the data, even in the middle of the, of, of the series. And I, I don't think we can do a fair, you know, a good model if we have this change between the the uh, within a series that we are collecting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess that we we will have to be very careful on, on taking okay what is uh, what is reported from 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 each country. Um, I remember a, a specific case, for example, with the mortality data, with the sorry, with the disease data. Uh, there was a news on the here on the on the on the main journals saying, okay, Spain is no longer the country with uh, the highest number of disease people. It, it, it's Belgium, okay. Belgium were, uh, was counting um, also deaths in uh, elderly care facilities and so on. So they, they, their number was really higher than, than, than us. So I think that in that sense, uh, okay, for if the evolution of the, of the series, uh, collects, let's say, the main features of the variable that we are analyzing, we may try to do some comparisons. But I think that we should work, really work on a way of trying to do our data more homogeneous. Otherwise, I, I, I think that we, our conclusions may not be, may not be trustful enough. And, and we, ha we have to, to, to be aware of that. Um, this, this is really, this is really serious. I, when, when we started, um, analyzing the intensive care demand, uh, we were seeing that in some regions, this upper asymptote, okay, that would saturate the system will be reached really soon. Okay, and uh, then we realized that not all the regions were reporting the same data. So at some point you may give a message that, okay, you, you're okay, you, you, your intensive care facilities are enough, but if you don't have a quality data, if you don't really even know exactly what they are reporting, it's really hard to, to, to produce a conclusion from your models. Thank you. So there's another question uh, saying, uh, this, all the different Spanish groups, uh, were they using the same variable definitions? I, I mean, I hope they were, but uh, how did you make how did you make sure? How did you uh, check this? Yeah, well, well, from the cooperative uh, from the cooperative predictor, we we have to use the same data with the same definition. And for instance, there were there was a change last week on how the okay the government reported the new cases. So there was an agreement, okay, what we are going to, how we are going to produce our series. Okay, well, from now on, just with PCR cases. So all the predictions that we are uh, giving to these cooperative predictions are based on the same data. Thank you. So next question, uh, how to make sure that the data is reliable? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Ah, uh, what is, Reliable. I mean, um, uh, I think that, for instance, with the uh, intensive care um, patients, okay, because this happens at the at the very beginning of of, of our analysis. If you have a variable that it's defined as, let's say, uh, the intensive care patients until a certain day, I don't think that for us, for us statisticians or mathematicians, it's I think that we all see clear that it's a cumulative variable, okay? So uh, at some point we see that in a region, I think it was in Madrid, it was the same as the day before or even lower. And then they say they were reporting just daily cases. And at some point they have reported cumulative and then daily and then cumulative again. And they, don't e they didn't even know what they were reporting. 
I think that there's a problem about this, uh, about the importance that we give to data. I know that the main the main uh, goal now is to is to save lives. Okay, we uh, in the hospital they have to attend patients and they have to save their life. So it seems that re data re uh, registers it's not that important. And I think that people are not conscious that getting good data now will uh, will let us get a better incident of what's going on and be able to take right decisions in the future. And until all of us. Well, I think that all of us are aware of this until our authorities are aware of this. That's, there's a little hope for us to, to be able to do something uh, reasonable and, and to be sure about what we are reporting. It's very frustrating that you have a model that is fitting everything and say, okay, and I can give you this estimate with this degree of variability. But at some point you discover that the numbers that you got there are wrong because someone has been neglecting okay what they have really to collect thank you yeah so so there's a related question uh, saying is it possible to use some kind of cross validation for, for testing uh, the validity of the model cross validation for testing the validity of the model well, uh, uh, we have not thought about that. I don't know if the group of the cooperatives predicted, but that could be that could be an uh, that that could be an option. Uh, however, I just think that in in this case, uh, the 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 idea for going to this cooperative prediction is that the, the task was just to have these short term predictions. Okay, so in that in in that sense, I have also to 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 say that um, most of the of the models were doing quite well. I mean, it's. It's not, it's not such a complicated thing to model in a short term period. Another issue will be once we have, when, if we are able to include, okay, what happens with the yes. actions of the governments. And also, I think that there are other variables, uh, also connecting with this idea, that this message that I, I tried to transmit at the end about this global view of the problem, the mobility. Okay. I attended a conference a couple of weeks ago in, in Brazil, and they were modeling the spread within the country, which is just like, <laughs> like Europe, nothing comparable to, to our countries. They were including the mobility by uh, putting weights on the airplanes, on the flights route. Okay. And they knew how this, they could predict how this, uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the virus will spread in different areas. And they were, for instance, really concerned about what happens in, you know, if, they, if it's goes to Macau and to the Amazonia area. Yeah. Okay. I think that here in, in Europe, we, we should have also a, a more global view because I think that mobility is important also for this. Thank you. Uh, another question. Can estimates on dark figures of infected people be included? We have one minute more because then we have to move to the next speaker. So uh, if we can wrap up in one minute, that would be great. Okay, just uh, uh, cases from infected people. Well, uh, right now in Spain, they are conducting a, um, an, an study. We didn't have access to the technical details. That's a pity. Uh, just to uh, control the, the, the infected people and to just yes, know how is the situation in, in the population. Certainly, I think that, that that would be an important variable. The other, the another issue is, okay, should we get, could we get this data? And, and we actually, we don't uh, really know how this was designed. They produce it, uh, they, they are going to do a sampling, but we don't have the, the details. So that's great. Uh, thank you, Rosa. Uh, on YouTube, you have you cannot hear the applause, but many people uh, say thank you for the talk. Um, so uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. So for those joining us now, uh, we are at the ECMI webinar, Mathematics of the COVID-19 Crisis. Uh, I'm Katerina Kauri, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Thomas Goetz, from the University of Koblenz. You can post questions to the speaker at any time on YouTube where you are, uh, search for live chat. And our two moderators are reading the questions uh, throughout the, the talk. And when the speaker finishes, uh, they will ask these questions to the speaker. 
And uh, Thomas is here to talk to us about his microstructure simulations of COVID-19 in Germany. So thank you, Thomas, for being here. And the stage is yours. OK, thanks very much, Katarina. And now I'll try with the screen sharing. OK, so I hope you can see my screen. And um, yeah, well, this is now my talk about modeling uh, COVID-19 in Germany by microstructure simulations and by some other methods. And um, well, this is something coming from a larger group. So it's not just me and the group in Koblenz, but this is a joint work with lots of people uh, from universities in Poland, namely the uh, Technical University in Wroclaw. University of Trier, University of Kaiserslautern, and some colleague from Sri Lanka as well. So what I'm going to tell you today about is on the one hand about our microstructure simulations that we were carrying out. And these microstructure simulations were already, well, initiated by the group uh, in Wroclaw. And then we somehow modified it to simulate now the uh, COVID-19 spread in Germany as well as in Poland. And questions that we were uh, trying to ask or trying to, to answer with these microstructure simulations are on the one hand, is this mitigation uh, strategy that is now mostly followed in the majority of European and other countries, will this work out? Unfortunately, our result is that it is likely to fail. And the other thing that we tried to simulate here was the effect of school openings, since um, by beginning of next week, some schools in Germany will open and we were interested in seeing what will be the effect of that. The second thing that I would like to tell about is what we are currently doing in the uh, field of SIR type models and parameter estimation. And in particular, focusing on the question, can we estimate the dark figure in the number of COVID-19 cases? Since the official reports that you get, whether you look them up from John Hopkins University or from the National uh, Health Institutes, they just give you, well, half the truth or maybe less than half the truth, since lots of asymptomatic cases are not really detected. And the next thing that we try to include into the SIR models, um, some of the effect of the household structure since infections typically happen either within the households. And this is something that you can never avoid, uh, in particular, not by these contact bans or curfews that are imposed by most of the governments. In fact, infections within the household, they will happen anyway. And so you will get a sort of background spread of this disease independent on how you restrictive are you are with respect to the public. So this is roughly the outline of the talk. And now I would first of all like to go uh, into these microstructure simulations. I will not tell you anything about the timeline of the, uh, this disease. This was already covered by Rosa in her talk. So microstructure simulations. What we're doing there are agent-based simulations uh, in discrete time, and it's a mostly stochastic model. So what we do is we sample the population, let's say of Germany, of Poland, or just take a city like Berlin, and include the age and household structure for this entire population data on this age and household structure, um, they are very often available from census data. The contact structure you have either within the households or outside the households. And outside the households, you can model this contact structure as a random graph where each individual, each person has a certain number of typical contacts, social contacts, and then Within these social contexts, you have a certain time that you spend in. So you have different contact kernels. And these uh, contact kernels somehow 
tell you something about the probability that the disease will be uh, transmitted from one individual to the next one. So the population structure here is based on the official census data. For Poland, we have it from 2019. For Germany, we have used the data from 2014, since this was the last available one to us. Then if you think about the details of the disease itself, well, first of all, you have an incubation time. And if you look it up in the existing medical literature on this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, then the incubation time seems to be, well, log normal distributed. This is what we assumed. And then as soon as you are um, incubation, then uh, for the severe or critical cases, the time to hospitalization is assumed to be a gamma distributed process. And the infection period itself depends on the one hand on the age of the person and on the disease progression. Again, right now you do have some uh, available statistics on the age dependent probability for this disease progression. And here on the table, you will find roughly uh, the values that we were using. So for the younger part of the population, or maybe I go until 50, such that I'm also included in the younger part, um, most of the cases seem to be mild cases, at least for the ones that are reported. And only very few cases are critical cases that uh, need intensive care. And you get a completely different picture if you look it up for older people. Then you see that here already approximately one third of the people are suffering from a critical disease progression, which uh, requires intensive care. And according to the data that we have used, almost 50% of the critical cases die. And these critical cases are also the limiting factor in all these uh, mitigation strategies, since somehow the limiting factor is the number of available uh, beds in the intensive care units in hospitals or uh, breathing support machines. So this is some of the data on the disease that we have used for our microstructure model. The contact structure, uh, well, on the one hand, with within the households, you have some sort of a click structure. So everyone who's inside the household can uh, in fact, the other ones and the infection probability uh, basically scales on the one hand with the infectious time and on the other hand with the household size. Outside the households, the number of these secondary infections that are produced there is assumed to be a Poisson distributed process with an average outside reproduction number. So the, this R star uh, is somehow proportional on the one hand to the infectious time and on the other hand to the, this parameter C, which is somehow the number of average contacts that you do have. And in our model, this R star acts as a free parameter which determines the number of infections that one person generates outside the household. And at the very beginning, at the onset of the um, disease. So basically for Germany, this was until second, uh, first half of March, where no real restrictions were imposed. We were able to estimate this R star from the data. And then as soon as uh, contact restrictions were imposed, somehow this R star, the number of secondary infections was decreasing and somehow you can then uh, investigate how much you need to reduce these outside household uh, contacts in order to achieve certain goals. And somehow the two questions that we were asking is on the one hand, is mitigation possible? And on that one, we have uh, published a first preprint of this entire group. And you can find it here in the given link on the Met Archive. 
And then uh, just recently, last week, we had uh, also published a technical report on the effect of the school openings for the, st for the state of Rheinland-Palatinate, where uh, the universities of Koblenz, Trier, and Kaiserslautern are lying in. But unfortunately, this technical report is until now just available in German. Okay, so now to the two questions. Is mitigation possible? Well, as I said, mitigation is likely to fail. Uh, but the overall task of this mitigation structures is always to keep on the one hand infections below the capacity of the healthcare system. So not to overrun the health system with too many critical cases. But on the other hand, you need to keep the infections uh, above the suppression level. Uh, for not crying out the infection, for dying out the infection. So you, you, need, you want to achieve in the long run this herd immunity. And this R star acts as a control parameter. And of course, as soon as you impose contact bands or curfews, this R star will decrease. And as soon as you um, reduce these um, measures, then the R star will rise again. And here's the result in short. So for the two countries that we were investigating for this uh, preprint, so for Poland and Germany, from the observed data, so this was in the period before the onset of any uh, governmental restrictions, before the onset of any curfew measures or something like that, this R star was approximately a little bit above three. So 3.04 for Germany, 3.16 for Poland. And now if you want to, achieve this goal of mitigation. So do not completely suppress the infection, but keep it below the uh, limits of the healthcare system. Then there is a very, very narrow interval of suitable values for this R star parameter in which this mitigation can work. So for Germany, this is approximately 0.37 until 0.42. So this means you have to reduce the secondary infections from 3.04 to 0.37, so basically to down to 80%. And then within this narrow band, you have to stay in this very, very small interval. And this interval is really small, which means that somehow if you allow just a little bit too many contacts, then mitigation will fail and you will overrun the health system. If you impose too strict measures, then also you will, the, uh, you will completely suppress the um, virus and you will not reach in the long run this uh, goal of herd immunity. So therefore we believe that this mitigation structure is a very yeah, sensitive to these parameters and therefore might likely to fail. So here are just a few uh, sample results for Germany. On the left hand side is what happens if you choose this R star parameter as the smallest one. So this is basically what you can see with the number of infections and the hospitalized cases for Germany over a time period of approximately one year. So somehow the number of infections will die out, but clearly you stay below the uh, available AC, ICU beds. Then on the right hand side, here you can see what happens if you choose the R star parameter to be the maximal allowed value. Well, then you can see that sooner or later, so here approximately after 70 days, you would exceed the available ICU beds and then somehow um, your number of deceased cases will just start to explode. And in the middle, you see some value in between where you would have the ICU beds required approximately close to the available uh, number of cases. So this is somehow what you would say, okay, maybe this is still acceptable, but this is a very, very narrow bandwidth. And now this is um, somehow the result for uh, testing and social distancing if you apply it just to Wroclaw on the 
x-axis here, you can see the R star value as a fraction of the initial R star value. So basically one means no contact band measures, zero means full contact bands or no outside um, contacts anymore. And here you would have the detection rate of mild cases. So basically how many cases you really detect by testing. So if you do more testing, you might detect more cases. And here you have given uh, the mean time in days until the ICU capacity is exceeded. So what you can see is if you have um, low or somehow you reduce the context, let's say to one third of the ones before the onset of any measures. And if you do not do any um, testing, so no, wait. If you do not do any test, if you, yeah, if you do not do any testing, then you will somehow soon um, overrun the health system. And then as you increase the detection rate, the situation gets better. And if you do lots of testing, and testing also means that you put people under quarantine, then um, you will have somehow the chance of not overrunning your ICU capacity. And somehow this is now also uh, taking into account the effect of backtracking. So if you do not only do detection, but if you also try to um, backtrack other contacts and put them also under quarantine. So again, if you would try to reduce the contacts, let's say by uh, 60 or 70%, so two thirds of that. And if you somehow have um, your contact tracking effectiveness, zero means no uh, tracking or very high tracking, then with the very high tracking, then you have the chance that after, let's say approximately 100 days, you will have no infections anymore so that you will have completely uh, suppressed the whole um, disease. So these results are rather new ones from the group around Till Kruger from Wroclaw uh, obtained in the last days. So now having a look at the time, so we should quickly also jump into uh, what we have done for the school opening. So Germany partly opens the schools from 27th uh, or 5th or 4th of May onwards. And what we did were some simulations for Rhine and Palatinite. And for these um, simulations, we also assumed a certain degree of background immunity. So a certain number of people that had already uh, suffered from the disease and have some antibodies against it. Then we did simulations for opening for different grades, since there was a discussion in Germany whether to open it only for the last grade, so for those ones that will finish this year or next year's school, or should you open it to more groups. And we also consider different levels of social distancing at school, since social distancing uh, at, for school kids might be some sort of a problem if they meet again after one and a half months for the first time. So these are here roughly just the results. So here we have as the scenario with no opening of schools and the external context, so the external uh, curfew measures are still very strict. So we just allow around 11% of the original contacts that were there before the crisis. And if you have a immunity level in the um, entire population of 1%, then the prevalence of cases uh, after one year would be 405 for the state of Rhine Palatinite. And if you increase the immunity level, this one will go down. Now, if you allow school opening for just for the uh, highest grades of grade 12, and in schools, you think that school kids will have around 39% of the contacts before the crisis, then you can see the prevalence is drastically increasing. 
and even sorry worse. To interrupt. Uh, sorry to interrupt. We are running uh, out of time. Um, so maybe wrap up a bit more quickly the last part because I see there are still. Uh, yeah, I, I, like I, will, I will skip the SIR part. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now since we have uh, here now, if you allow at the schools, just uh, more contacts, then the prevalence is growing even higher. So as a conclusion out of that one, one would say that according to these simulation results, opening of schools currently might not yet be a good idea since somehow there are still too many uh, undetected cases around in the population and that school openings might pose a well, severe problem to the health system uh, in the near future. But I hope that we are wrong with these simulations, but time will tell. And here are again some uh, sample results. So for the ICU cases in uh, Rana Palatinite and when the uh, capacity of the healthcare system might be exceeded. So according to the simulations here, this could happen at around well, 200 days after the school openings. Okay, so for the SIR type models, there were also some uh, preprints on that. One just recently appeared today. And so just for the results of what we get for the SIR type models, for the uh, somehow accumulated cases and for the death cases, the agreement is quite good. And what we are able to estimate are parameters on the one hand for the detection rate, which tells you something about the dark figure. So in our model, we can estimate this um, case of, or the parameter which reflects the detected cases to be 0 0.2, which means that just 20% of all cases are detected. So the dark figure is not, it's not 20%, but it would be a factor of five uh, higher than what is currently appearing in the statistics. And if you model the overall lethality here, then we end up with approximately 4%. But of course, you have to take into account that this is also taking into account the unestimated cases. And these parameters beta, beta zero gives you the uh, transmission rate of the disease before the onset of any contact ban measure. So at the beginning of March, it was 0 0.55. Beta two was after school closings. And by that, the number of contacts was effectively reduced by a factor um, three to four, which means just 30% approximately of the overall uh, contacts survived. Okay, so in order to come back to the original schedule, and I think I was scheduled for 1430 until 15. So I think I have uh, now to stop such a we are back on time. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, great to hear uh, what is happening in Germany. Um, we have again many, many uh, questions because there are more than 300 people on YouTube. And uh, uh, so I'll leave the moderators to, to start with that and we'll have 10 minutes for this and then we we'll go to the next speaker. So first question is, um, how do you calibrate these micro models with real data? For example, think of the 0.6% of asymptomatic cases. Was it based on testing data? Thank you. Um, so the data that we had used for the disease progression, this is something that we uh, took from existing medical literature. So this was reported data from China from South Korea. So we try to uh, find, dig out what was available by, the, available by the time of these simulations and someone make some sort of an averaging for the different countries since for Germany or for Poland, by that time there were not too many uh, reliable statistics available. Okay, so, so there's another question saying, um, 
what is the actual evidence of herd immunity existing? Because not all diseases uh, have a well-defined herd immunity. Um, so if there is evidence for the herd immunity, I mean, this is a question one should better pose to a, a person from medicine or microbiology. Um, so here as a mathematician, I cannot really give a sound answer to this question. I mean, since up to my knowledge, there do not exist any reliable tests on these antibodies. And this is a still ongoing uh, discussion among uh, epidemiologists and uh, people from medicine for which period you might be um, immune against this disease. So this is something no one knows at the moment. Most people believe that you will be uh, somehow immune against COVID-19 for one year, one and a half years, but this is still under discussion. So this is just a hope that we will be immune for a period, but up to my knowledge, there's no concrete okay. answer yet. Okay, thank you. So next question is more mathematical. So what, plaf what platform was used to implement the agent-based modeling? <laughs> what platform was used? Um, this program, well, all the simulations are running in Python and they are running on different machines uh, depending on the size of simulations that you are trying to do. So the simulations for entire Germany, they were running on some of the larger um, computing servers at the university in Kaiserslautern. The smaller ones, so if you would like to do the simulation just for Rhino Palatinite, where you might have approximately 4 million people, or if you do the simulation for just the city of Rotslav with uh, around 600,000 people, this is something that you could do with the same Python code on your uh, laptop or on your, de or on your desktop at home. And, but it depends then on, of course, since this is a stochastic uh, model, of course you need to do several runs in parallel to get some meaningful results by averaging. But let's say the simulation for Germany on the compute servers uh, needs, let's say something around one up to two hours computing time. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so we have a question from one of the other speakers. So uh, Ufe Hirspo has a question. And so if he's uh, live, he can ask it uh, directly to you. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Thomas. It is about this uh, likely to fail conclusion. Uh, it, the, the way I understand it is that you are assuming that this, um, I believe you called it R star, is constant and fixed during the period and therefore the narrow interval leads you to conclude that it's likely to fail. But I'm wondering, isn't this a feedback system where both uh, the government will uh, adapt their behavior uh, based on the numbers and also the general public will adapt its behavior? Uh, based on the numbers so that that um, uh, so that we shouldn't view R as a constant, but rather it's something that's continuously adapted to the situation and that will broaden the range. I'm curious about your thoughts about that. Um, yeah, may, maybe you are right that, that this, of course, this R star is not really a constant. And I mean, this is now something that is under discussion or that you can observe in Germany. I mean, since somehow it seems that this mitigation structure and somehow was quite successful. So the number of cases was significantly dropping. This leads now to the fact that uh, the public believes, okay, the whole situation is not that dramatic. So therefore the context will rise again. In that sense, the system might stabilize itself this is something one would have to uh, somehow look deeper into it and make a more refined simulation on the, the, what is the effect of that feedback loop. But still, I believe that the interval for this suitable R star values is rather small and therefore maybe too narrow for the system. Since if you're running for a certain period of time out of this narrow interval, then you start again with this exponential growth and I mean, 
right now we have reached a situation where there are that many people already um, infected. And if you now look, somehow allow more contacts, then you, it's very likely that very soon the uh, health system will be overloaded. So that, that's a problem. But you're right, one might need to do their more refined simulations. Thank you. So uh, is there any other question, uh, Paul? You well? Yes, we have a question here. Uh, in reality, ICU capacity changes over time. Uh, in the plots, it is set as a constant. Could this affect the values of uh, R star mean and R star max? And could this have a significant impact? Um, well, yes, the, but at the moment, it's really unclear on how much it or how much this uh, ICU bed capacity will change over time. I mean, on the one hand, you could have the hope that somehow due to some further investments and so on, you might increase the capacity there. On the other hand, the longer the disease progressed, it turned out that people had to stay longer in intensive care than people initially thought. So one bed is occupied longer by one person. So there might be different uh, effects in there which are running in opposite directions. And by the time when we did the simulation, so this was, I mean, this preprint uh, from the microstructure simulations already appeared uh, at the end of March. By that time, we didn't have too many information on that. But maybe with the knowledge that we do have right now, one month after, it could be, uh, interesting to have a look into this again and to see how this uh, changes. Thank you. So, so let's take one, one more question. Sorry, Paul, let's take one more question and then we move on to the next speaker. Okay, so there's a question here saying, uh, did you do some perturbation experiment with your model to see if the mitigation parameter sensitivity is still observable? Uh, yes, we, we tried uh, some parameter study, so perturbing the parameters a little bit. And we found that some of the result is rather stable with respect to that. The same thing you can observe uh, in the study, for example, regarding the school effect of school opening. There, I mean, whether you just allow the grade 12 in Germany to enter school or whether you allow it for the three highest grades so for grade 10 until 12. I mean, it slightly changes the absolute prevalence that the, re the simulations report at the very end of the period, but the general trend and the order of magnitude remains the same. So this is a minor effect. So we, we try to do some parameter studies, yes. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Thomas. I'm sure all our uh, 394 viewers are uh, very thankful to you also. Uh, so our next um, uh, speaker here is uh, Professor um, Uffe Chisen uh, from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, you can, uh, for those that are joining us now, we are at the ECMI webinar, Mathematics of the COVID-19 uh, Crisis. You can keep posting questions on YouTube for the speaker at any time. And we have here two moderators, uh, Paul and uh, Miguel, they are reading them and uh, they will ask them to the speaker at the end of his talk. Uh, so with this, uh, the stage is yours, Uffe, and looking forward to hear what is going on in Denmark now. Bye, for now. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. So, okay, so um, I will give you a brief uh, overview of the uh, corona epidemic in Denmark and the modeling efforts uh, that um, we pursue to describe it. Uh, briefly, uh, the reason I'm here, I assume the reasons I was invited here was that I um, participate in this expert group, which is formed by the Danish authorities to model the epidemic. So we provide uh, advice to the health authorities 
Um, I should stress that I do not speak on behalf of this group here. I just speak as an applied mathematician. Um, so uh, the overview of, um, uh, of the course of the epidemic in Denmark, here's a, uh, here's a quick rundown of what happened. Uh, what we're viewing on this graph here is the number of uh, hospitalizations uh, for each day here. And uh, we can see that there was an initial rise in the, the first half of March. The surge of patients in Denmark was highly triggered by uh, Danes who went on the uh, winter vacation uh, and came home uh, with, uh, with the disease. So that was the initial surge. Uh, and then rather quickly, the, the government issued a lockdown. And that means that the exponential phase that we have uh, witnessed in, in many other countries uh, was never uh, that clear in Denmark because uh, first it was dominated by, by this uh, import of, um, of vacationers and afterwards it was affected by the lockdown. Um, so the lockdown was uh, uh, decided on March uh, 11th, 12th. Uh, and what we see is that it took uh, 13 days uh, from the lockdown for the hospitalizations to peak. And that agrees with our uh, general understanding of the time it, it uh, takes from, um, from people getting infected to they appear at the hospitals. Uh, we also see that the lockdown was perhaps even more effective than we had uh, thought. Um, the, after the, the effect materialized, we had a fairly uh, steep uh, decline. And that caused the government to do a partial reopening uh, of uh, society just after Easter. Uh, I'll just, I don't go through, I will not go through the details, but uh, in the lockdown um, consisted uh, mainly of closing the schools, restaurants, malls, liberal professions, large gatherings non-essential government workers were sent home, such as myself, and the borders were closed. Uh, and the reopening that has been uh, uh, put in effect now is that we have been opening the daycare and schools for the lower grades. Um, the reason why we have focused on the lower grades is so that the parents can go back to work. And then the liberal professions have been reopened. Uh, so in this uh, group here that uh, we are uh, trying to uh, model this uh, epidemic, and I'll give a very quick overview of the models that we uh, employ to study this, these dynamics. Uh, the, it, the most um, important element is an ODE model of uh, SIR type for the dynamics. I'll cover that in, in some detail. We also have a stochastic individual based model uh, that uh, aims to do the same thing. I don't, will not uh, go into detail with that. We have a time series analysis models that does estimation and short term prediction, uh, a survival analysis model that uh, uh, aims to describe the flow through hospitals, and then certain uh, variety of smaller models and model components, uh, statistical models, uh, model components for study process studies, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll try to give you a quick rundown of uh, these models and what we learned from them. The, uh, the core is an ODE model of SIR type. I believe everybody knows the uh, SIR model, uh, but otherwise I've put it up here in the top right corner. Uh, but in this case here, we have extended with more states. So here's a state diagram of uh, which compartment an individual can be in, starting with being susceptible, then being exposed in a latent state. And then we have different causes of infections, some that are mild and some that are more severe. They imply hospitalizations and stay at critical ICUs at the hospitals where they may circulate back and forth until they either recover or die. Um, the uh, original model that was formulated operated with uh, two H groups, so um, with a threshold of H uh, 60 years. Um, the key element in these ODE models here uh, is the contact structure. So if I just uh, point out in the standard SIR model, we have this beta parameter here that gives the contact and then um, uh, here, when we are doing with, uh, with two H groups, then this beta is replaced by a, a two by two matrix um, uh, describing the various uh, uh, contacts between H groups. 
And uh, so the key difficulty in parameterizing the, these uh, models is to uh, establish these contact structures. And uh, how did we do that? We based that on observed contacts between age groups in different contexts, uh, family, work, etc. Those are based on two studies in a British context uh, by Masong and Klipak. Klipak. And then um, we scaled those with estimated risks of trans transmission uh, getting from a uh, contact to an actual uh, disease transmitting contact. And that last step is um, crucial and uh, very uh, uncertain. So that, those are the contact structures. Um, the other parameters describing the flow of these uh, through these uh, compartments here uh, was calibrated based on uh, clinical studies and data from the literature on um, um, uh, on the procreation of the disease within an individual. Uh, the main objective of these uh, models uh, was to answer questions regarding the load on the healthcare system. And therefore, a, a critical uh, question uh, is, once people get uh, sick, to which degree, do, which load does a, a, a patient inflict on the healthcare system here? And to do that, uh, we developed uh, statistical models of uh, so-called survival analysis character that describe the flow of uh, patients through the hospital system. And once again, here we have the, the young people uh, below 60 and the older people over 60 here. And what this graph here shows, um, yeah, sorry, the text is in Danish. This is because this is part of the report to the authorities. What we have here is in the, uh, the number of days uh, since you are being hospitalized. And then what we see here are the fractions of patients in the various states at the hospitals. So we see that um, a fairly large per, uh, fraction of the uh, younger patients are being discharged within uh, four days. 50% are being discharged after four days. Um, and then 10% uh, roughly uh, are uh, transferred to the ICUs uh, after um, uh, being at the hospital of, uh, up to a week. Uh, we see in the older group, there is uh, this uh, additional uh, color here that enters in. Where the, those are the patients that uh, uh, do not survive the, um, uh, the stay at the hospital. And, but that is hardly at all visible among the young ones in agreement with, uh, with what other people have said about the uh, fatality risk for this disease here. So these uh, graphs here, once we have uh, an, an SIR model that can predict the dynamics of the disease in the uh, society, that leads to a number of infections, which leads to a number of hospitalizations. And then this model can take over and predict the load on the various units in the hospitals. So how did the uh, model then uh, perform here? So. Uh, uh, our first um, report uh, was submitted on April 2nd on uh, predictions on, on the course of the dynamics. And, um, and to the left here, we see the, the figure that was in that, um, that report, uh, which was the uh, predicted um, number of uh, people in, uh, in the hospitals. Um, this here is uh, based on uh, stochastic uh, simulation in uh, a Bayesian setting. So we assign priors to all the parameters and we uh, adjust for a likelihood based on match with observations that gives a posterior distribution. And therefore you see not just one line, but rather a, a probability distribution. So the way uh, to read this graph here is that uh, at that day on April 2nd, uh, we had a prediction of the number of people in the hospitals and the median was roughly, what should we say, 600, uh, 600 people, but then with a fairly large uh, uncertainty. Now we can compare that. This, this year was a prediction that we submitted on uh, April 2nd. And now, of course, we can see what happened since then. And uh, we can see here that uh, this, was the, this here is the actual number of uh, people in the hospitals. And we can see that we were slightly um, um, uh, over pessimistic uh, regarding the effect of the lockdown. 
So uh, this, this prediction here were, uh, was uh, submitted when the numbers were still rising and we, couldn't, we hadn't seen the effect of the lockdown in the data yet. And we predicted that it would be a very uh, gradual uh, slope after the peak. But we can see in reality, it, uh, the peak was, um, was um, uh, sharper than we had predicted. And the way we interpret this is that the social distancing and the, um, and the behavior of the general public was more effective than we had predicted. And uh, in a broad sense, uh, this leads at least me to conclude that, uh, that just as much, this is not just about government interventions. Uh, this is uh, even more about the uh, behavioral decisions that the public takes uh, on, on, on a daily basis when they choose uh, uh, who to meet and who not to meet. Um, and we can see here that the choices of the public was uh, very effective in, in, uh, in halting the epidemic. Since then, uh, we have seen the numbers have uh, continued to decline. Uh, we haven't seen the effect of the reopening yet, but we expect to see that within the next uh, days or at least the next week, uh, the numbers should be begin to tickle in. Um, uh, we also did um, a statistical time series model uh, that aims to estimate the reproduction number and based on that do short term prediction. Um, the objective of short term, -term uh, prediction is mostly to, to assist uh, the healthcare system with, uh, with uh, planning uh, what, what, what are they in for. Uh, to the left here, we see the estimated uh, development in the reproduction number. We see a large drop in the re reproduction number uh, at the time of the, um, uh, of the government intervention, the lockdown, some uh, dynamics after that. I should note that the exact shape of uh, this curve here is, has to be taken with a grain of salt because everything happened at once. There was a government lockdown and the uh, there was a general awareness in the public and it all happened within the same days. So it's uh, quite difficult statistically to distinguish uh, which effect comes from that. Um, and what we can see here is uh, based on that, we can do a short-term prediction of the number of um, uh, hospitalizations in the near future. So this, uh, the data points here are the historical hospitalizations on a daily basis, and uh, the gray zone here indicates a short-term prediction uh, with the mean value um, by black and the uh, gray zone a confidence interval. If you were, if you are curious about the jiggering here, that is due to the so-called weekend effect that uh, less people seem to be hospitalized during the weekend. The current challenge um, of now uh, is to predict the effect of various reopening decisions. And uh, so we're trying our best to uh, predict that. But there are a number of key uncertainties, uh, and I would like to, um, to discuss those uh, one at a time. First of all, we have the, the number and the role of asymptomatic cases. This is uh, related partially to the so-called dark figure. Uh, it also relates specifically to the role of children in this epidemic that we know that children are not affected severely by this um, uh, disease, but uh, we're not sure to which degree they are able to pass on the disease. Uh, that seems to be a key uncertainty. In, in general, um, we know far too little about in which situations the disease is transmitted. We have some numbers about uh, transmissions within households, within families. Uh, we also have evidence that uh, large events, um, uh, mass gatherings have been uh, very effective in spreading the disease. Uh, so uh, we've seen a number of, of unfortunate um, incidents, uh, but the general picture about which situations exactly, uh, in which situations, uh, uh, is the disease transmitted, that remains um, uh, in, incompletely understood. And that, of course, means that it is, uh, that limits our ability to, to say which uh, measures will be most uh, effective and particular uh, cost effective. Uh, 
There's a question of heterogeneity that also uh, remains poorly understood. We can see that, uh, and heterogeneity here, I mean, uh, the, the different difference between individuals um, in uh, passing on the disease. Uh, I'll return to that in just a, a minute here. Um, we, have, we are very uh, focusing on the load on the hospital system. And therefore, the question at who exactly are most at risk, that is also uh, not, uh, not well enough. Uh, uh, we don't understand that quite well enough. We have an idea, but it's not, um, um, it's not um, we don't have a complete understanding yet. And then this uh, crucial uh, question for the long-term uh, course of the epidemic is the acquisition and loss of immunity and uh, the mutations. And those are, of course, uh, big jokers uh, that can uh, change the entire picture. Uh, I'll just talk in, in some detail about some of these points here. Uh, the, uh, the risk for individual uh, patients here. Now, it has been, been established uh, that the, um, the risk of um, um, associated with this disease here grows with age. And what we see here is a, a plot that verifies this. We've already, in, uh, in the, uh, I think it was Thomas who showed a previous uh, similar numbers for the risk at, in various age groups. So the uh, dots here are uh, against age here, I plot the uh, mortality. This is the so-called infection fatality ratio. Um, and we see that it is roughly a straight line. Uh, and this is uh, on a semi-logarithmic. So uh, the, uh, the mortality roughly grows exponentially with age. Uh, I've also included uh, the yearly background mortality um, in, in Denmark. Uh, and we see that they follow roughly each other, except uh, there's an increased uh, mortality among the very young children. But apart from that, they seem to be roughly following the same line. And that means that the uh, infection fatality ratio uh, associated um, with uh, COVID-19 corresponds to roughly a year and a half background mortality, just uh, rough numbers, something like that. Um, they, then we know that there are a number of um, uh, comorbidities that can uh, alter that picture, but we don't, in a quantitative session, in, in a quantitative sense, we don't know well enough uh, the, uh, the specific risk associated with these uh, comorbidities. Uh, what we can see here are cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And all these risks here, we know that they uh, imply uh, increased um, uh, risk, but exactly what are the, uh, the exact numbers uh, we're not sure about, in particular since many of these diseases here are uh, correlated with each other and also with age. A, a question which is uh, also um, uh, an uncertainty is the role of um, uh, heterogeneity. And here to illustrate that, I focused on spatial structure. So this is a map of Denmark. We have the Copenhagen region here. And we can, when we zoom in, we can see that there are hot spots. Um, and then across the country, there are extra uh, hot spots uh, at specific places in the country. Parts of, parts of this can be understood in terms of socioeconomics and uh, uh, and sub, uh, subcultures, uh, but there's also simply a degree of uh, randomness which we can uh, attribute to the importance of singular events. Uh, singular events that can have uh, a large um, effect on the local cause of the epidemic. Uh, so one big event in one particular location can affect the numbers in that region uh, severely. So uh, I think my time is up here. So just to uh, uh, conclude, uh, this situation here has required very fast uh, modeling cycles. And we have uh, very quickly uh, developed uh, uh, models to uh, respond to this situation. Uh, we uh, rely on a suite of models, uh, as, I, uh, as I demonstrated here, results from the ODE SIR. Uh, model, um, but uh, we have an additional agent-based model, and we use these models to sort of support each other um, to, to gain confidence in the predictions from the models. Um, 
uh, as uh, a modeler, uh, it is a frustrating uh, term of this work here that the actual knowledge about this disease here remains a bottleneck. There are simply so many things that we uh, wish we knew, but we don't know them yet. We will have to uh, make it up as we go along here. Uh, and then, so that's the bad news. And the good news is that what we've seen here is uh, increased in agreement in the society that science-based advice will be crucial to overcoming this crisis. So uh, uh, our work uh, really matters here, and this could just turn out to be our finest hour. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay. So thank you very much for relaying all these um, uh, modeling approaches for Denmark. Um, I hear we have uh, a few questions again. So Miguel, I think we'll ask the next, the first one. Okay, hi. So um, there is an early question there. Does your model or your models assume that all of Denmark is a unit with population around five millions or is it broken down locally? Um, so uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> that is a fluent uh, that's a fluent answer here. So the initial model was uh, was at national level, uh, and and now we're pursuing uh, local uh, regional models. Thank you. Okay, so so there was another question uh, saying. Uh, how did you, can you briefly review how you set the various uh, parameters of the model and, and how many parameters, uh, for how many independent parameters uh, are there in the model? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean with the model, but I assume now you're talking about the, uh, the ODE uh, yes. model, SIR model. Um, so uh, I don't remember the exact number, but I will say it's, uh, if I say 25 parameters, it's okay. probably in that ballpark. Um, and uh, as I said, it was based on first uh, literature studies um, uh, where we, uh, uh, based on clinical, uh, clinical studies, gave us many of these transmission rates once you have the disease. Uh, the contact rates, uh, we, we started out by uh, these um, uh, empirical studies of contacts between individuals uh, based on these two British studies. We don't have, a, uh, we don't have a, a Danish study of that sort, so we assumed that the British numbers were valid for, for the Danish study as well. Um, then uh, the, the, big, the big joker is to which degree does a contact imply uh, transmission yes. of the disease. And that turns out to be just one number that we scale the entire thing up and down with in order to match the exponential growth rate that the data showed in the beginning. Uh, that's, that is a very crude uh, way of yeah. formulating it, but the way you can say that is that that's it. this is a way we get to, to uh, the Bayesian posteria. So the literature gives a Bayesian priors on all these numbers, and then based on observed time series, we obtain posteriors. Thank you. So another question here um, regarding the uh, increasing the complexity of uh, zero-like models. Uh, does it not increase also the propagation of errors made in the parameter estimation? Yeah, um, totally. Uh, there's always a sweet spot between a model. Um, uh, complexity and fidelity and um, uh, feasibility uh, and I don't know what's uh, in general terms yes the more structure we build into the model uh, the more fine-grained uh, questions we can answer but also uh, the the more this noise becomes uh, evident so um, uh, in general, I certainly agree with the question, and we just have to um, uh, well, we, we, what we do is that we gradually add complexity and uh, do sanity checks at each step. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? I think uh, we take one more. All right. And then uh, we move on to the next speaker. Okay, so, so the next question in the, in the line uh, asks, um, given these large 
uncertainty, has there been any effort uh, to connect uh, with the approaches from decision making under deep uncertainty research? There's apparently in, in, in decision research, there's an area called deep uncertainty. I'm not uh, familiar with the term deep uncertainty. Um, uh, I agree that uh, I agree that what we are dealing here with is uh, um, uh, a question of decision making under uncertainty. I will say that that is actually uh, that has not been our task. Our task has been to to uh, take a number of uh, proposed scenarios and do uh, and predict the consequences of that. And then we report the back, uh, report uh, those predictions back. So um, our um, uh, our task was never to give uh, advice on decision making or suggest uh, decisions. Thank you. So with this, um, thank you very much, Ufe, for this great talk. Um, so the next uh, uh, speaker in the line is Professor Renato Colombo from the University of Brescia. For those joining now, uh, we are at the ECMI webinar, Mathematics of the COVID-19 uh, Crisis. Uh, you can use the live chat option on YouTube to ask questions at any time. And our two moderators, uh, Paul and Miguel, they are reading them and uh, they are uh, uh, filtering them uh, if needed and asking the question the, the questions from the speaker in the at the end of the talk. So with this, uh, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Colombo. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Let me just thank you, Katerina and Dietmar, for their very precious help. I'm going to describe some studies, some models, some results that I obtained together with Mauro Caravello, Francesca Marcellini, and Elena Rossi and acknowledge the support of uh, INDAM and of the Other System Academic Initiative from IBM. Well, uh, this is more or less the, the plan of the talk, but I start immediately with the SIR model that was already recalled. This model is pretty famous. It, I'm not sure that this 1927 reference is a starting point of this uh, kind of modeling, but this modeling describes the variation in time. This dot means the time derivative of the number of susceptible individuals, these are the individuals that can get ill. Then there is a time derivative of those people that are already ill, which are the infected people, the I population. And then these people in the I population can recover and enter the R population. And R dot is the time derivative of the R population. Uh, having in mind the present COVID uh, pandemic, we first introduce quarantine. That is to say we split infected people between those who are infective, and we still call them I, and those who are not infective. They can be hospitalized in a, in a hospital or they can be in quarantine in a private home, but the I population is infective, the H population is not infective. And this distinction we believe is, is uh, relevant in modeling the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that is to say, instead of three equations, we will have four. Then the next step, we introduce age structure because we all heard the news and we know that different uh, class, age classes in our population were infected in different ways. Another uh, feature which we believe is essential is the space dependence, a kind of geographic uh, uh, memory you have to remember where people are and how they move. That is to say, we introduce also the space variable. So everywhere T will be time, A will be the age, and X, I will use only X to denote a coordinate in the plane or in a region capital X. So here we have these uh, uh, convect these equations. They are partial differential equations of the first, third order here. And they are essentially, they will be balanced laws. And as it is usual in the SIR model, we also have mortality. I don't devote much time about mortality because we describe it in the usual way. It is proportional to the population with a coefficient, these mu's that are the mortality. Each population, S, I, H, and R, has its own mortality, which is time, age, and space dependent. Much more relevant is the interaction. We want to describe how 
these population interact, or more precisely, how people from the S population enter the I, the H, or eventually the R population. And first, we single out those uh, interactions that we believe are possible. That is to say here, up here, we will introduce a term describing how the S, that is the healthy people, will enter the I, that is to say the infected people, OK? And there is a minus because they will decrease the amount of the S people. And the same term appears here so that the total number of S plus I does not change, but there is a transfer movement from the S population to the I population. Similarly, we will have terms that describe how people that are infected enter quarantine. That is to say, here we have a term with a minus, and the same term appear, he appears here with a plus, meaning that the same people that pass from I to H appear in both equations, and so on with the passing from H to R, I to R, and so on. Okay, so first, this K kappa times I is the rate at which infective individuals are confined, okay? Confined and they enter quarantine. And we imagine that this is proportional to I with a coefficient that depends on time, age, and the space variable. Then similarly, we model the, the interaction between the I population and the R population, that is say the speed at which people in the infected people recover with this term theta. And similarly, there will be a similar factor eta describing how fast people from the quarantine, from the H population, get health again. Clearly, the most relevant term is the S to I interaction, that is to say how people get ill. And uh, this is the rate at which susceptible people, people or individuals are infected. And here we introduce a non-local term. Okay, don't worry about the integral. This only means that the susceptible individual, the healthy individual at time t of age A in position X, gets ill due to how many infected people are of all ages are next to him. And this function rho that plays a key role will tell you how much relevant is the presence of an I individual to make the S individual uh, ill, okay? So here we have a term which is non-local in the A variable, in the here alpha variable, and also in the psi variable. So it is a non-local dependence on the infected population. And uh, okay, this is what we are proposing with uh, Mauro Garvello, Francesco Marcellino, and Elena Rossi. And as you all noticed, uh, I guess, we did not consider a term describing how people can become, uh, in, uh, can enter the S population again after they recovered. We hope there will be no need of this term, but for the moment, from the modeling point of view, this is not an issue because it would amount only to add one extra term coupling the first and the last equation, but for the moment, we did not consider it optimistically. Now, uh, here we have uh, our model, this in the square, these are four partial differential equations. The independent variables are time, age, and space. And uh, as you see, we have uh, probably, uh, sorry, uh, here we have also the movement. These Vs are the speed at which uh, the, these uh, population move around in the region we are considering. So we have a full uh, age and space dependent modeling. And rho plays a key role because it describes the transmission of disease. And for instance, a typical feature we may require on the function rho is that whenever x and xi are far apart, then rho is zero. What does this mean? This means that if an infected people is at xi, yeah, sorry, if an infected person or infective person is at xi, and a susceptible person if is at x, if their distance is sufficiently large, then there's no infection, no passing of the disease. And I think this, again, is a crucial information that has to be present in a model for this COVID-19 pandemic. Another key feature in, uh, in this modeling is uh, the parameter kappa. This parameter kappa tells us how quickly infective individuals are isolated and enter the age population. This way, they are set to quarantine. And they are not infective anymore. They're still ill, but they don't infect anyone. So this kappa, again, as we all heard also in the previous uh, communications and from the news, does play a, 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 same, a key role in this modeling. Now, uh, once we have the, this, this tool, what do we want to do with it? 
for the time being, as was already stated in the, the previous communications, it's very difficult to have very good data. And if the data, the very good data is not available, I believe it is also difficult to have very good forecasts. Our aim now is to check whether this system of partial differential equation does capture or not the key features of this pandemic. And uh, one of the first uh, numbers that uh, got to, to the news, to the newspapers, is this coefficient of zero. I guess all over Europe, at least, uh, it was called in the same way. And uh, this gives a measure of uh, how infective the situation is, how dangerous the situation is. And uh, we can compute it on the basis of the solutions to our equation. And we define it as this, uh, this ratio, according to the standard literature. And you see, I don't want to, to, to stress anyone with uh, difficult formulae, but you see here we're talking about averages. And these averages are averages in, in H and averages in space. So when we write down the rigorous definition of this quantity, we'll have integrals. And since they are average, we will, we will have also ratios of integrals. So uh, this is uh, R0, how it can be computed on the basis of this model. And this is the full uh, expression of this R0, which uh, once the, the model is solved, once the equations composing the models are solved, is just a question of a quadrature of, of pure integrals. Well, once uh, uh, this is, is done, we pass to, uh, to, to study, to see, if uh, the, the actual solutions to this equation do or do not uh, uh, capture some qualitative features which we believe have a key role in the spreading of this pandemic. And in this first integration, first of all, we neglect these terms. These terms, uh, clearly they are present in the model. We can make them enter any numerical integration, of course, but on a short time interval, that is to say, on the interval, on a time interval of uh, several weeks or months, I don't think it is relevant to, to take into consideration the aging of the population. So for the time being and for the next integration, we neglect these terms. Similarly, for the time being, we also neglect uh, the movement in space, and we will play a little bit more on the function rho to describe some movements below. Okay, So with this uh, approximation, we pass to a system of uh, ordinary differential equation, which again is non-local uh, because it contains the, this, uh, these integrals. And these are the, the equations we are, we are going to, to numerically integrate. Uh, clearly, if you have questions on the numerical part and ready to answer, I will not enter now in the, trick, in the numerical tricks, but I, I will come back to this point later anyway. And throughout the, throughout the, the examples I'm going to, to consider, we distinguish four classes mainly because these are the classes for which we found some data. And that is to say the four classes will be one, the first age will be 40 years wide. So the first class is from zero to 40 years. And then we consider three different classes of about 20 years from 40 to 60, from 60 to 80 and above 80. Okay, so let's pass from, from the equations to what these equations tell us. First of all, I consider a very artificial situation here we have the x1 and x2 variables in all four diagrams, the, the, the x and the y, you can call them. And uh, on these uh, diagrams, we see the contour plots of the function s, that is to say the number of uh, susceptible individuals here. Here, we always have the number of infected individuals. Those who are hospitalized is down here. And down right, you see the number of people that recover, okay? And you will see the running time next to the label of the population. And here, there is a very artificial initial datum saying that here we have all people, I'll tell you, all people of the first age class. Here there are people of the second age class. Here there are people of the third age class. And here are the elder people of the fourth age class. And they are separated sufficiently enough that they do not infect each other. And down here, at time zero, we have some infected people of their own age classes that will spread the infection. Down here, we will see how many get to quarantine, and here we'll see how many recover. And so if we let the integration start, okay, sorry for this. Uh, okay, here you see the integration that starts. We have the, uh, 
You see, the spreading, as we expect, does not depend so much on the age. The last class is uh, slower. You see here, the S disappear because this S individual enter the I class and become infected and eventually hospitalized. And finally, they might recover. The class of the oldest people is slower only because they, um, unfortunately, they die more often. So their quantity diminishes. There is less density and therefore the population spreads slower. Now, another example. Here we see the role of the density not of the age as before, but of the density. Again, the initial datum is quite artificial in the sense that we split our ge geographical domain into these four regions. Here we have a low population density. You see this color amounts to this very low level of the population density. Here we have a higher population density, even higher here. And here we have the highest population, okay? Now, when uh, we start, we let some infective individuals here, and these infected individuals, we spread the, their, their disease, and we see the speed at which the disease spreads depends very much on the density. You see, where the population density is highest, there the disease runs faster, and we have less people remain susceptible, we have more people that are ill, and then Luckily, and at the end, some people recover. Now, let's. This is just to to understand how the the most relevant uh, pieces of the model glue together. So we have age plays one role, but population density plays another role. Now let's get to some more realistic situations. Uh, in all these integrations, we use the uh, parameters that are built up built up on the Italian situation. Okay, uh, as I stated here, you see where I said parameters are inspired by Italian data. We computed them on the data that are publicly available. And uh, one, of the, one of the most tragic situations that, that uh, took place in Italy is that of care homes, which in Italy we call them with an acronym RSA. In these homes, uh, the, what happened was that the, the raw, the, the infection ran, ran much faster than the outside. So what will happen here is that here you have the S population with more or less a constant density. And here you have a bunch of infected people that are going to infect the S population. More or less here where the mouse is now and more or less there, there are two care houses or care homes. And you will see that the, the, the disease explodes here. You see, even if, as soon as a little number of infected people go there, they explode. So and the density of the S gets blue, meaning that all the susceptible got ill immediately there, okay? And again, we believe this is a dramatically realistic feature of, of this model. And you see that uh, you, one, hardly see, one hardly sees the wave of uh, the infection getting to, to the, the care home, but nevertheless, it, if it starts again, it, it pops up. And then some, at least it is sufficient that a very small number of, of, uh, uh, of infected individuals get near to, to these uh, um, care houses and the infection spreads. Again, we believe that to capture this situation, it is necessary to have a model where age and space do play a role. In fact, here we plotted the total amount of uh, individuals in the I population and you see that at the very beginning, there is an increase, which is a standard increase that uh, takes place throughout the region. But here there is a jump. And this jump is due to the big jump in the infection over the most, the oldest people. And this big jump on the oldest people uh, causes this jump in the overall uh, total mass. Then uh, this, uh, as time goes by, the infection reaches also the second care, how, care home. And here we have a second step in the number of infected people. And as you see, as a result of all this, also the other population, the three youngest segments of the population are infected more rapidly. And you see that here we have, again, a, a quick increase in the number of infected people. And again, these are 
the numbers here, while the parameters, the functions, the news, etc., are taken from the, the tables and from the data, the actual initial datum here was uh, is, is invented, but the qualitative feature that come out is, from as far as I understand, quite realistic. Now, another another event that apparently played a big role in the spreading of this pandemic in Italy was a match, a football match, between Atlanta, Atlanta from Bergamo and Valencia that was played in Milan. And uh, we tried to, to capture this event also here, comparing a situation, a possible situation where no match takes place, as it is written here. And later we'll see the differences when the match does take place. And uh, the happening of the match is, uh, is uh, described through a function rho that uh, between time 0 0.2 and time 0 0.7 will uh, increase uh, the function rho before, that is to say, will uh, describe the fact that a lot of people group together. So let's see first what happens when no match takes place. And you see that here and there, there are places where some infected people are and the infection spreads. And you see that as time goes by, the number here, there is a hole in the S population because the S population get ill and those who are ill get partly in quarantine, partly recovered. Now, what happens when we add the match between time 0 0.2 and time 0 0.7, if you look carefully, almost at the begin beginning, that is to say starting from time 0 0.2, you will see a blow up, not really a blow up, but an explosion, a, an increase in the speed at which the pandemic uh, grows and here is you see now okay we already passed time 0 0.7 and now the situation is already critical and we see that now again the spreading is slower than before but the damage is done the damage is done and we see that uh, here there are no more healthy people they partly are here but here and to describe the whole situation in the case, this is the, inter the total number of infected individuals. In case there is no match, we have this amount. Here you see, uh, observe, they have, the two diagrams have the same scale. So here we have at about 60 people. But in case, in the situation in which the match does take place, and the, the, clearly with, with all what uh, football, match, football match means, between time 0 0.2 and time 0 0.7, there is really a quite sharp increase in the eye population, which eventually remains. And at the end, we have a much bigger number of infective and infected people. And uh, sadly, we, I mean, within this model, we can also compare the number of deaths due to the virus, that is say number of deaths in the eye population and the number of deaths in the age population. And uh, again, the, the situation is dramatically different. So uh, again, this uh, is in agreement with uh, the common sense that uh, these big happenings have to be absolutely avoided. And uh, finally, I have this, this final example where uh, uh, we try to understand and describe the effect of kappa. This kappa, I remind you, is that coefficient that tells us how many people from the I population get to the H population, that is to say, when kappa is low, we have very little people in quarantine. When kappa is low, we have uh, infected people moving around, a lot of them. On the other hand, later we'll see what happens when kappa is high. And kappa high means quarantine, means uh, lockdown, means that infected people are as soon as possible blocked and either put to hospital or asked to remain at home. So let's first start with a situation with a low kappa Again, we see some kind of random places where the pandemic outbreaks. And uh, where the pandemic outbreaks, you see you have holes in the susceptible density and you have increases in the I, H, and later in the R density. Now, let's see what happens in the case kappa is quite large. When kappa is large, you see these contour plots show qualitatively a similar feature because the geometry more or less is the same, but the quantities are quite different. Here on the contour plot, that's not so much seen. 
but uh, if we pass now to the uh, number of uh, people in the aged population, that is those who are in quarantine, we see immediately that when case low, obviously there are less people in the aged population. When, age, when kappa is larger, there are more people in the aged population. And sadly, again, there's a consequence in the number of deaths. And we pass again here, uh, there's a big difference from what happens when kappa, the number, the, the effects, the, the lockdown is present and when it is not present. And uh, uh, finally, I conclude stating uh, or describing where we want to go from here. Well, being mathematicians, clearly uh, we are also uh, interested in proving rigorously well posedness, stability, and qualitative properties of uh, this model. As far as we know, there's no theorem now in the literature ensuring the well posedness of this equation, but we are confident that well posedness does hold. Another nice mathematical question is to estimate the propagation speed of this uh, disease and try to understand which are the most important factors that increase or decrease this propagation speed. I would like also to point out to the need of uh, efficient ad hoc numerical algorithm. It's very easy to scale down this problem. If you want to describe a situation of uh, a few hundred kilometers, uh, which is less than a standard nation, and uh, you have that delta we saw before, which is the radius at which uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this disease can pa be passed from one individual to another, then we have a region which is something like 10 to the five meters and uh, a delta which is one meter. And if we have to make an integral on a domain of uh, diameter delta, we need a mesh that goes below the meter. That is to say, we need matrices that are 10 to the five by 10 to the five and it's, it's not so easy. I mean, it was not easy for us with our machines to, to describe that. Luckily, we used some of the PSIA from IBM uh, machines, but I think that uh, numer good numerical arguments that would allow to, to spare memory and to have a more efficient computation would be very useful. And uh, again, I want to stress that uh, uh, we would like to get qualitative information from this modeling rather than quantitative ones. Uh, for instance, there are different ways in which we can exit from the quarantine, and uh, we would like to compare some of them. Uh, some research, by chance, a couple of years ago with Nora Garavello, we were interested in, in checking different strategies in the case of the SIR model. And another qualitative uh, information we would like to obtain is to compare different vaccination policies in the sense that uh, we all hope that in the future uh, vaccine will be available for this disease and then uh, if ever it will be av available we'll have to use it and uh, which will be the most efficient and in which sense policy to use this uh, vaccine again we hope that this model can be of help in the qualitative comparison of these uh, uh, different solutions thank you for your attention Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, previously, we have many questions. So unfortunately, we only have six minutes uh, to go. Uh, so uh, Professor Colombo, if you can be uh, as fast as possible with the responses so that we can go through many of them, that would be great. Um, yeah, sure. So then the first question. Hello, so the first question is, um, how did you validate your model with data? This was an early question, but uh, it's still uh, valid. Sorry, how did I validate with? So how did you validate your model with the uh, real data? Oh, of course I did not validate the model in the sense that we are now interested in a qualitative agreement with uh, what we are uh, expecting, what we are experiencing in these days. I, as was already mentioned in several of the previous communications, it's very hard to have reliable data. And I believe that if reliable data is not available, it is at the same level very difficult to have a reliable, for, quantitatively reliable forecast. That's why we put most of our efforts on, quanti, of, on, sorry, sorry, on qualitatively correct uh, information. So we want to capture qualitative features of our model, and we want to 
make comparisons between different attitudes, for instance, different exit strategies from, from the current time. This is our aim. However, we do have the, the, the software and uh, everything is freely available. And also, the, the, I mean, it's, it is possible to, to try to use this model also for quantitatively correct uh, forecasts, but this was not our aim, at least not up to now. Thank you, this sounds very sensible. Okay, so, so here's another early and technical question. How did you actually simulate these PDEs? Uh, uh, are there collision terms on the right-hand side, like uh, lattice Boltzmann methods or how? Yeah, how okay. Uh, this is uh, our, uh, our model. As you see on the left-hand side, we have essentially a conservation law on the right-hand side, we have what usually is called a source term. So for the conservative part, we used, uh, well, in principle, we used uh, uh, the exact solution wherever possible because part of this equation can be solved exactly for what concerns the, the most of the convective part and the mortality terms. Concerning the interaction terms, we use essentially an uh, ODE solver, okay? Oh. And the two methods are put together with operator splitting. I don't know if I should enter more technically into that. Maybe and we don't from have time. The... Sorry? It, we may from not have time for this, yeah. Okay, stop. Yeah. So Correct. I will stop here. Yes, yeah, so the next question is, um, uh, it's a question about the non-local term. Uh, so, um, yeah. uh, is, uh, so the argument is that the effective distance at which the virus might be transmitted is of the same scale as the distance between the agents. So what is the motivation for the local, for I, the non-local term? I, I think I understand the same distance as? So, uh, the yeah, so the statement is that the effective distance at which the, vir the virus may, might be transmitted is of the same scale as the distance between the agents. Uh, so what is the motivation of the non-local terms? Well, um, I think that uh, it uh, would be um, the non-local term from the technical point of view also allows the diffusion. The diffusion, not in analytical term, I'm using, usually diffusion means a Laplacian in mathematics. I'm not using any Laplacian, but the fact that the disease spreads is due to the fact that an individual at a certain position can infect people also at other positions. If I allow the individual at position Xi to infect only the person at the position X, then the, there will be no, no, no spreading of the disease. And I believe in a sense, I expect that some stochastic model might lead to something similar to that in the sense that the very position of each single individual is not so completely well known. And I believe it is very reasonable to imagine that an infected individual moving around also infects all of all the region around him or her. So I think it is reasonable to expect that uh, we have this, this term with uh, especially this property that if uh, the distance between the susceptible and infected is bigger than a certain threshold, there's no infection. But I think that all of this data is present. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it was uh, very interesting to also see these uh, special independent uh, models for the COVID-19 um, uh, spread. Um, so now, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Colombo, again, and uh, we'll go to the next speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Swapnil Mishra. Uh, Swapnil is a senior postdoctoral fellow at Imperial College. Uh, he's one of the key people in uh, the model that have been running there uh, while consulting the UK government. So um, for those joining us now, uh, this is the ECMI webinar, Mathematics of the COVID-19 Crisis. You can post questions for the speaker at any time on the YouTube live chat. And our two moderators, Professor um, Bustamande and Professor Hjorth are reading these questions and uh, they will ask them to the speaker at the end of his talk. So with this, uh, the stage is yours, uh, Dr. Mishra, and bye for now. Thank you, Katrina. So hi guys, I'm Swapnil. Thanks for 
inviting me. Uh, so what I'm going to present is a model that we have yeah, recently used to basically estimate the impact of non-pharmaceutical in interventions on COVID-19. As uh, Katrina said already, this is a joint work with a lot of people. It's essentially, I would say it is the whole Imperial College uh, COVID-19 response team. And this is not the only work that we have been doing. So uh, as she said that we have been involved in advising UK government, more or less most of those models were the agent-based model that Neil has developed. But what we have developed and what we are more into looking into some different kind of models. And I just want to make a claim that whatever I'm saying here is not as a part of Imperial College London team, all views that I'm expressing are mine, right? So let's start with the motivation. So in general, the COVID-19 emerged in Europe uh, quite later when, with respect to China, some, sometime in, Jan, in January or some, something around that time. As once the COVID situation became bad or it became serious, various governments started implementing various control measures. Uh, once the control measures have been put into place, and now we need a way that we can find the effectiveness of these measures or essentially in interventions. Now, one of the key things that in epidemiology or while doing any pandemic that people want to estimate is a time varying reproduction number. Uh, but actually estimating this in this scenario is quite difficult or it's quite challenging and essentially because of three reasons. First is a high proportion of infections have not been detected by health systems up till now. Second is even, if, even the policies around testing has been changing, which means the number of cases that we are looking or the reported number of cases is not essentially the cases. It's, it's just a function of the testing strategies. And more importantly, most of the health system, even in Europe, uh, even in Europe has capacity only to test actually high risk cases. So this basically means if you do your estimations on reported cases, it will be systematically biased. Uh, we think a more reliable source is observed deaths. And basically you can take observed deaths use it to back calculate the infections, and then you can use those infections to basically calculate the reproduction, reproduction numbers. So that is essentially what we are doing in our current model. So let's see what our model is. And this is sort of a pictorial view of the model, uh, not the mathematical view. I'll come back to the mathematical view a bit later. So what we are trying to say in here is, there is a time varying re re reproduction number, which has, and this time varying reproduction number changes with time as that's why it's time varying. But there is a basic reproduction number for disease that people call it as R0. Once you have that, you can actually get infections if you actually know the serial interval distribution. Serial interval distribution is essentially the distribution which is which says what is the distribution of going from onset of a disease to start infecting people. And once you have infections, you can basically get infection to systems uh, symptoms distribution and symptoms with that distribution to actually get deaths from there. And once you combine all these things together and you multiply it with the in infection fatality ratio, you can basically get the exact number of deaths or the model deaths, and then you basically linked it with the observed deaths. So essentially, this is the whole system that we are trying to build in. Now the point is because we wanted to somehow estimate the effectiveness of the time varying reproduction number, we basically say that the time varying reproduction number is going to be some function of various interventions that has been uh, done, done by various governments. And the interventions that we have essentially looked is social distancing, uh, in, 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 encourage uh, basically policies by the government, case-based isolation, schools and uh, universities closure, banning of public events, and essentially the lockdown. What we say is in our model, essentially that the effect of all these interventions is shared across all the countries that we are uh, looking into right now. And then for a few of these effects, there are some, there are some country specific effects and all the in interventions uh, are essentially, we have collected a data for all the interventions in all different countries. Uh, right now, the model that I'm presenting in here or the results that I'm presenting 
we go through 11 U european countries but uh, but now we have extended the model to more european countries now we have a regional model for italy regional model for germany now we have a regional model for us also now let's see what our model is so let's i'll first give a brief description of how we are modeling stuff so the first thing that we are doing is we model the deaths in our distribute uh, we say the deaths uh, the observed deaths is basically has a negative binomial likelihood of the model deaths and because it's a negative binomial you basically have an uh, uh, it's different from a poisson likelihood and you actually have got your variance which is more than uh, which in, in increases with the mean and we are saying that the uh, that the variance in here is basically normally distributed between 0 to 5 the next thing is to as, as i said for all the models in here we will need an ifr which is an inf infection fatality ratio we are saying that whatever is the infection fatality ratio for a particular country m there is some chance of that the uh, infection that we have right now knowledge is uh, ha having some noise in there or we do not accurately know what's in there. So we say, therefore, we basically say uh, we multiplied with a normal with 1 comma 0 0.1. And again, this IFR of for each country is not a single, like it's not the one value that we have got. We basically have done the specific thing of weighting it with respect to the population, how the how the population is across countries and then multiplying the at at attack rates specific to the population division and then calculating a new, a new IFR and which is what I'm showing here. And then finally, there is this distribution, which I said earlier, the first is a gamma distribution, which is basically from on, which is from infection to onset, which is basically a gamma distribution with mean of 5.1 and coefficient of variation 0 0.86. And second is basically onset to death distribution. So we basically say from infection to death is basically is new distribution pi, which is basically a combination of two uh, gamma distributions, which is infection to onset and onset to death. And the onset to death is basically a gamma with 17.8 mean and coefficient of variation 0 0.45. All the numbers in here are essentially based on earlier studies that people have done uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak in, Ch in China and South Korea. So that's the thing. Uh, and later on, obviously, because we are using the hard numbers in here, we have also done sensitivity analysis of basically using the different numbers that people have reported uh, for our cases. And finally, what we say is that the model that's at any time point T for a country M is basically the infection to fatality ratio for that country M and this is the with the noise basically what you do and we here we are saying the c is basically the current is the number of infections at time point p out for country m and this basically gets multiplied by the distribution of the, the, the distribution pi which basically is pi of t minus star so this is what we are saying is that that's at time point t is some function of the infections at time point which which were before this multiplied by this distribution that is defining how the infections are getting converted into this and then fi finally we have this ifr which basically uh, translates everything into the ex ex exact number of deaths once we have the death model we we go with the we go and do the inf infection model now what we use for infection model is essentially a straightforward thing uh, which is a renewal equation where what you are saying is Infections that are there at this time point T are essentially the infections at some time point tau earlier than T multiplied by the generation generation time distribution for that, that infection and which is then multiplied and this so basically what this is saying is infection at day one gets multiplied by uh, by the generation time then plus in, infection at day two with with the generation of T minus two and then you basically go the same way around. So basically what you're saying is all infections in past are causing future infections and their weight is decided by this uh, distribution G of T minus one, right? And RT is the reproduction number. This renal equation is quite common. Like people have, uh, pe uh, you can go and 
get this from an uh, like people have gone around and gotten this from basically age dependent branching processes like bellman harris and stuff so that's from where it comes from but we also have this new term stm which is basically the susceptible population of a country at time t at point m what we are basically saying is if you don't have this term basically you will keep on growing further and further so this term stm basically just makes sure that at each time point you are decreasing the total number of people who are now more susceptible so this is like you are basically ad adjusting for the susceptible population level now the generation time distribution which is also known as the serial time in uh, serial time distribution we have used them we have said that th this is a gamma with mean of 6.5 and coefficient of variation of 0.62 again this number comes from uh, the study from china uh, where people have come up with this and we are using it but then we have actually sensitivity analysis are around a lot lot of this now once we have this as i said the aim of the study is to actually have rt the the reproduction uh, uh, the reproduction number at time t for each country we parameterize it in two ways what we basically do is we say rtfm is r not of m which is the initial reproduction number multiplied by e raised to power uh there is some coefficient for each so in here k is basically all intervention so it is saying first intervention what is the value of first intervention at time t for country m and that if it is the first intervention it gets multiplied by its coefficient alpha uh, uh with the respect to alpha, alpha and finally all this alpha coefficients are same across all the countries so we are basically pooling we are full pooling this uh, this al alpha variable so and there is one coefficient that is taking control of the effect of an intervention across all the nations but then there is this country specific variable beta m which we have used only on the lockdown which is our fifth variable and why only on the lockdown basically because when we did our studies we realized lockdown was the most effective intervention and apart from lockdown all other interventions were basically unidentifiable so we were not sure we you can really identify them because of the cruel linearity of lot of this interventions when they took place and and how they took place so therefore we are basically partial pooling or we are basically partial pooling only across a lockdown intervention what we are basically saying is for lockdown there will be a over overall global effect and then each country will have its own specific lockdown effect that will basically uh, uh, scale the rt and if you try to look at this equation what basically it is saying is that time t equal to 0 when there has been no interventions the r not that you will the rt at that time point will be r not and that's what you essentially want to have r not to look as and then as and when you will start getting each intervention your r not can change with respect to that now how much r not can can change will depend upon the value of the variables alpha k is right now for r not m we say again uh we say it's a normal distribution with uh uh with mean 3.28 and uh with this uh, standard deviation kappa again the number 3.28 is a number that's been taken from the literature right now but the fact that we we have got kappa in here and allows us to basically in in in, in a vision way are not m to go i either up or down from 3.8 depending upon what data dictates and then as i said this choice of alpha k is quite critical that how you want your alpha k to be so our priors on alpha k have been put in such a way that individually if any of the intervention is on there is a 50% chance of that intervention either being successful in getting down the uh, uh, getting down the r not or not being successful but as soon as all interventions are in place together there is a uniform chance between 1 to 1.05 of this interventions basically uh, uh, scaling down r not m so this way this is a prior which is basically giving equal chance to interventions to either increase r not which we don't hope it should but at least we give chance to it and when all of them are in together there is an equal chance of how effective they are 
and so this way if at all we see any effect in our r nots any decline in our r nots it will essentially be driven by data and finally for the each country level effect of beta we basically say it's a normal distribution between uh, from 0 to gamma with a different gamma where gamma can go from 0 point very uh, where gamma is itself normal distribution from 0 to 0.2 if you want to see what this is doing is basically what it is saying is from a global effect of the alpha for uh, for the lockdown effect for each country individually it can go like it can deviate or it can have either more or less uh, it can be either more or less effective than the global effect by almost like at most by 40% on either direction with a normal 0.2 because of saying that the mean is zero and then you basically go to standard deviation on both sides right so we have that now just looking at for interventions what we have done so for interventions the interventions that we have looked into is the case based self isolation mandated so this is the intervention that talked about if you are if you have been identified or if you have symptoms you should isolate yourself then the government think of social distancing encourage then government think of banning public events government think of banning school uh, ordering school closure and the lockdown if you see this is just an idea of saying when each intervention happened in each country just a thing to note is uh in sweden a lockdown has not happened yet so that's the only country where the lockdown has not happened and italy is essentially the country where the first interventions took place almost for most of the things up, 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 apart from case based isolation right now if you look at some of our results so this is the results as of yesterday the data on yesterday so what we have is in the middle graph we show uh, we are showing daily number of deaths uh, blue line is our fit where the lighter blue color is our 95% confidence interval of the mean and the darker blue color is the 50% confidence interval of the mean uh, the left plot is basically the daily number of infections and as you can see and the brown plots are basically the real data that you have up till now as you can see actually the daily number of infections are quite larger than the real reported cases and that's what we already said that actually there are a lot of people who are infected who might be asymptotic but they are infectious and they have not been tested and you just don't know about it and then on rt we have basically what's how the uh, reproduction number has been decreasing over time with respect to all interventions so this is for united kingdom as you can see for united kingdom uh, and which is the case for almost everywhere that all the interventions have some effect but lockdown was essentially the intervention that mattered most and that has brought down the uh, the reproduction number uh, for for each country uh, as a matter of fact we do the same and you, as you can see that for uk now this is less than one with almost certainty and we have actually the same results for italy france spain denmark norway austria basically apart from belgium and sweden we have it. and as you can see for sweden as because till now the lockdown has not happened uh, their rt is still above one which means there's still a chance of actually like as you can see the the graph for the number of deaths for uh, sweden is still going up and so that's something now once we have that there are some other things that we looked at that what is the total number of population infected uh in all these countries so the so these are like 14 countries that right now we have so as you can see in here uh more or less uh we are like the confidence in interval for country like sweden and for belgium like we have high numbers but that's also almost the case of uh the their death curves going out and more or less like more or less it's like 4 3% of the population in europe that's in this across this countries that is infected now as i said one of the things that we wanted to see was how effective the interventions have been and the way we have gone around and tried to talk about interventions in what i sh we show you in here is these are basically the parameters for all the interventions that i talked about lockdown public events school closure self isolation and social distancing encourage along with the intervention we also are saying whether that intervention was the first intervention that was used or whether that intervention like if that intervention was the first intervention 
So if you see in here, it is essentially the lo lockdown that has had the highest effect on reducing the transferability for things like school closure, cell closures, and social distancing. They have had some effect, but essentially the parameter is unidentifiable. All their CIs overlap and similar. And over the period earlier, we had no signals around it, but over the period uh, with our latest results, we can see even that the public events have got signal there and we can we have some confidence that yes, uh, the public events have had some effect in uh, reducing RT over time. Uh, to show that uh, what how effective the interventions have been, we said uh, in here we are showing two things. One is the model where we are, uh, so this is basically cumulative number of deaths uh, across all the countries. So our model is essentially the model where RT is modulated and the counterfactual model is a model where before the intervention kicked in all the countries, what was the RT in there? We used this, that RT and we said we propagated that RT further in time to see if none of the interventions would have happened, what would have happened in the number of deaths or how much effective they have been. So as you can see, the difference between the cumulative number of deaths that you see that, that you see for counterfactual and that's really observed or that's been done by our model is quite large. So this also gives a signal that yes, interventions have been effective. So more or less what I'm trying to say is in summary, we have got a semi-mechanistic Bayesian hierarchical model, which attempts to infer the in impact of interventions across 11 European countries. Uh, we have estimated that most of the countries have been able to manage or get or reduce their reproduction number. Uh, the proportion of population infected or the attack rate is to be highest in Sweden and Belgium and it's lowest in Norway, Austria, Germany. Uh, as I said earlier, lockdown in particular have had a large impact on reducing trans uh, tr transmission. However, given the counterfactual that we present, it is uh, we just want to have a caution in here that we still need, need to have monitoring and to see trends more so that we can be sure that things are under control. And that's almost more or less the next work that we are doing that how the exit strategy works and how we can lift things and then see how again our RTs or our things go up. And that will actually define that how slowly or how fast we can go and start uh, opening stuff and getting our stuff. Obviously, as with any model, our model has limitations, limitations and assumptions. The first is we have assumed that the change in the reproductive number is an immediate response to interventions, which might not be case. It as quite as quite intuitive to a lot of people. If government uh, orders a lockdown right now, it might not increase the contact patterns of people as of right now. It, those contact patterns will slowly decrease over time. But as in time when we did this uh, uh, study, we never had access to any other data, but now we have access to other kinds of data like mobility of people and where we can actually measure this change. And that's what our new models are working on. But the current model that we have presented, that's the thing. Other is we have assumed that the effect of getting down the reproduction number is same across all the countries for all the interventions, apart from lockdown, where we actually estimate a country specific effect. Unfortunately, for any other any other intervention, we could not estimate properly a specific like that. The data is just not there to statistically do that. Other thing is we have assumed that for this European countries, all the interventions that has have that have been taken place, they are sort of equally taken in all the countries. Although the implementation details vary from country to country, lockdown is a bit more strict in some countries, is a bit less strict in other. So we have not taken that into account. And then, as I've said, we have made assumptions about our model or about some mechanistic parameters, like what is the time between infections? Uh, we are able to observe all deaths, although uh, with, with new work, we actually have incorporated the under reporting also in our model. And then uh, there is this uh, serial interval distribution, then the in distribution between infection and death and between infection fatality ratios. But we have done our sensitivity studies and we have realized 
although you yeah, uh, our real numbers or the crude numbers changes but the major conclusion of our work has not changed that a lot of lives have been saved interventions have been successful it's just the numbers that the, the, that has changed uh, finally you can see all our stuff in here the report is available at this link the technical report is in here there is a website where we do estimate daily for the 14 european countries and we have open source uh, code we have already been talking with a lot of people who have collaborated with us and uh, so it's in there for everybody to see and just because i think i have a bit of time i'll just talk about some of the sensitivity studies that we have done so the first was as i said the generation distribution time or the serial interval that was so the one that we have used is 6.5 but what uh, others the other generation time in literature that pe people have thought about these things has been 5 7 and 8 and as you can see the total number of deaths averted if you have di different uh, generation time distribution they are considered in, in, uh, in their confidence intervals overlap which means yes our real numbers will change but not our but not the main conclusion that really the deaths have been averted or they have been successful so similarly we have done sensitivity on different onset to death distribution so then the one that we use is 17.8 in literature the other two main has been 13 and 15 we have tried to do them and again the same thing goes with our conclusion and if even with the real numbers or the or the effect of uh, effect on rt and stuff so this way i just want to say basically end by saying that the conclusion that things have been effective and a lots of life has been saved and we should still consider more uh, and we should still be uh, monitoring stuff is something that stays irrespective of some of the things that we have assumed or which we have sort of taken from the work which is not necessarily for europe but that the work that has come from the covid studies in south korea or in china thank you okay thank you very much um so uh we don't have much time for questions left uh we're running a few minutes late uh, since some time now but we'll take two questions and then uh, we will close this live stream and uh, some of the speakers will uh, join the live chat on YouTube where uh, they will be able to stay for a few more minutes to answer more questions. So for now, um, Shabnil, um, can you answer two questions and then we can close the live stream? Yeah. Um, who goes first? Yes, so uh, there's been a, a few questions about Sweden. Uh, there seems to be a confusion. So uh, the question is, um, how about Sweden? I mean, uh, it seems that the uh, the, the deaths uh, in Sweden are not too high, but uh, if you compare it, some people uh, argue that they're actually are high. So can you uh, talk about that the situation between, you know, having little lockdown and the number of deaths, particularly with Sweden? So with respect to Sweden, if you see, yes, the number of deaths are not that, again, with respect to Sweden, there are many things in there right now in data. One is the Swedish data has, so the data that we are using, it comes from ECDC uh, uh, and that data, and in Sweden, there has been a lot of right now politics about what are really the real numbers. Like the, the numbers across different sources have been changing and they have been there. So this is the best estimate that we have right now. Yeah, the numbers by itself are not as large as other countries but still the trend shows that they are increasing there is no sign in there that actually they are decreasing at, at least as per the model that we have right now thank you so, yeah okay so uh we have uh taking the questions in, in order that there is one more question about sweden uh, a very specific one saying your results from March 30th indicate that Sweden ended up with a R sub T equal 2.5, but now you say R sub T has landed around 1.2. How do you explain that uh, difference? So the difference is very simple. If people even, go, so first of all, the first thing is the results that people are quoting are the results when we didn't have the partial pooling on. Right. So that was the first thing. But the point is when that result came on, we didn't have data from Sweden to actually do partial pooling because that like that like up till that day, nothing had happened. 
if you see in here the distribution that requires it requires you two to three weeks to really infer something that's the first point the second point is still our values now if so if you see the values are around the date that people are talking we still have those values in our confidence interval yes our things have gone down because the epidemic has gone past now there is more data for us to estimate so the model obviously has gotten better better in estimating those things over time so that's the answer for that okay thank you okay so uh with this i would like to thank all our attendees for being here with us today the video will be available tomorrow on the youtube channel so you'll be able to watch it again if you want um and then as uh, we said earlier uh, some of our speakers uh, will be on the youtube live chat so we'll go and close now this uh, uh, live stream so thank you again for being here and thank you very much to our speakers for taking the time amid this very busy period for everybody. Bye. So I think... Um...